Last time I ever mentioned this club, we had just been Manchester United in one of the most cathartic experiences in recent years. With that result, the Gunners were now 5 points above 2nd place Man City with a game in hand. Funnily enough, our next match was against Man City, but not in the league. Instead, it was in the FA Cup, where the citizens beat us 1-0. The following week saw the return of league fixtures, and Arsenal would play Everton away from home. Everton up to this point had been performing terribly, and were tied for bottom of the table. But luckily for Evertonians, Mikel Arteta's kryptonite is Goodison Park. And a couple days before the fixture, Everton appointed Sean Dyche as their new manager. And it so happens that Brexit football is another one of Arteta's kryptonites. Under his charge, the Gunners have only ever beaten Sean Dyche once in five games. However, if I can overcome my fear of Michael Jackson's face in the late 2000s, then Mikel Arteta can sure as hell overcome two of his own fears. And from McNeil, I lied. It still terrifies me. But lucky us, Pep Guardiola had to face his own kryptonite the very next day. Tottenham away from home for some reason. I have never screamed more after a Harry Kane goal and hope to never again in my life. However, thanks to our North London rivals saving our asses, the gap was still 5 points. Going back to the Everton match though, I didn't get to watch it, but even looking at the highlights, it was still pretty concerning. Arsenal looked sloppier more than usual, and it's not like Everton stole those points. In fact, I would say they were the better team throughout. But hey, it's just one game is what I would have said had we not done the same exact thing in the first half against Brentford. Had any Brentford attacker been a little more composed than me seeing a baddie at the club, it would have been 2-0 to them. And while Arsenal slightly improved into the early stages of the second half, Brentford were looking even more threatening. Nevertheless, in the 66th minute, Arsenal scored against the momentum through substitute Leandro Trossard, a man with the creative abilities of René Magritte and the face of a sleepless engineering student. But Brentford didn't give up and returned the favour just 8 minutes later. There were suspicions of the goal being offside, however those claims were laid to rest and the goal was counted. Only problem was, they forgot to look at the entire play. Listen, it's one thing missing something that happened maybe further back. It's a much bigger problem though when you miss it against the player who literally created the f***ing goal. I'm genuinely convinced that you could take a random stranger off the street, put him in the VAR room, and they'd do just as well as an actual qualified official quote-unquote qualified. This time around, we were not so lucky, as Man City comfortably took down Aston Villa, and now the gap was just three points, with the next game being the long-awaited top-of-the-table clash. City entered the Emirates with a pretty standard lineup, but because of the lack of depth at left-back, Bernardo Silva would have to play as a makeshift fullback. And as Silva isn't a natural defender, this was a massive disadvantage for City. Arsenal, on the other hand, would see their typical lineup, with the return of Takahiro Tomogotsu. Takahiro didn't start well, however, as he was easily beaten by Haaland, but luckily there was no other player in blue to receive the striker's cross. Five minutes later, Arsenal's turn now. Zinchenko delivers a wonderful ball to a completely wide open Nketiah. But that was a really good look, a play that we have perfected throughout the entire season. Simply put, if we could just keep this up, it was only a matter of time when we'd see the Emirates explode like it has never before. By Haaland. But have no fear, Arsenal fans, because poor officiating never left. City were not letting off the gas, however, as they nearly went ahead again right before the half. But at halftime, Arsenal were dominating possession and had more shots. Unfortunately, none of this mattered because both teams only had one shot on target and Man City were utilizing their possession a lot better than we were. Into the second half, and it's Arsenal's worst nightmare. City have taken full control. However, thank f for the offside rule. But City kept mowing down anything in their path searching for that second goal. And then, the breakthrough happened. Oh yes. 
Oh yeah. Ten minutes later, the milk drinking cyborg gets in on the action, and that's game. With my happiness and hopes slowly dwindling, so was Arsenal's position in the table now. Thanks to a far superior goal difference, City were now back on top as Arsenal were on a three-game winless streak. But again, the Gunners still had a chance to pull ahead with that one game in hand. Arsenal a week later would travel to Birmingham and play Aston Villa, who were now managed by none other than Unai Emery. Five minutes played, Ollie Watkins dances with William Saliba, sends a laser past Ramsdale, and Emery's revenge tour is off to a fantastic start. However, Bukayo Saka says otherwise and responds just 10 minutes later. But once more, the Arsenal defense gets exposed by Emery. Coutinho scores, and now Arsenal are actively kissing their title hopes goodbye. Nonetheless, unlike the second half against City, the Gunners activated. And after a few close chances, the Ukrainian Swiss Army knife fizzes it into the bottom corner, and now it's 2 all. Arsenal continued to pepper the goal, and then came the moment with 15 minutes remaining as Odegaard slides it into the net. Oh! Aston Villa were refusing to lie down and die though, as both teams were going at each other's throats. Then, the second minute of the stoppage time, Jorginho with a Hail Mary hits the bar, but then the ball bounces off Emi Martinez's head into the net. Once a gunner, always a gunner. Finally, with the last kick of the match, Martinelli scores a fourth off a counter-attack and Arsenal win an insane thriller. This team was on a three-game winless streak coming into this. They were behind in the match twice, but in spite of it all, they had incredible resolve and found their path through the darkness. Not only was this an important win for Arsenal's title hopes, it was also a vital result for the team's morale. And by the grace of the gods, Nottingham Forest have stolen a point against Manchester City. All of a sudden, I now believe New Zealand is one of the largest countries in the world. Throughout the next two match days, Arsenal earned another two victories in matches against Leicester and Everton. Next was Bournemouth, and what better way for the Gunners to show they were back in form by conceding in the first 17 seconds. Then before the hour mark, Arsenal concede again, and now the league lead shrinks to just two points. But you can never count out the comeback kids. 62 minutes played, Arsenal get one back and drastically shift the momentum their way. Eight minutes later, substitute Reese Nelson squares it across the goal to Ben White who digs Arsenal's second goal across the line. Finally, right at the death, with tensions reaching ungodly levels, Reese Nelson on the edge of the box perfectly strikes a half volley into the net and the whole stadium erupts into pandemonium. Arsenal once again do the impossible and the league lead is back to a five point cushion. Five days later, we played out a two all draw with Sporting in the Europa League. And I'll be honest, and I know this could bite me back in the ass, I don't really care that much about the Europa League this season. Because for me, and also the fact that we don't have the great is death, it's just better to focus on one competition and that competition be the one that we have the better chance of winning. Nonetheless though, we followed that result with a very comfortable win against Fulham. A few days pass, the second leg against Sporting is played, and we lose on penalties. Whatever, we move. Oh, you gotta be kidding me. No. No. <laughs> No! With Arsenal losing their best performing defender of the season, doubts about this title charge were starting to resurface again. However, the Gunners didn't let the concerns phase them as they defeated both Palace and Leeds 4-1. Not to mention, Gabriel Jesus was 100% back and even scored against Leeds. But it would only get more difficult because Arsenal's next match was Liverpool at Anfield. The Gunners thought otherwise though, as they treated the Liverpool backline like it was Leeds and went up 2-0 after just 28 minutes. Watching this game was insane. I had hope, but never in my mind did I think Arsenal would be running away with it this early on. And then we did something I feared. We pissed off Anfield, and if you remember anything from that heated argument between Klopp and Arteta back in 2021, you'll know that if you rile up Anfield just even a little bit, the momentum will shift so far Liverpool's side that not even the Galaxy 11 could defeat them. Just one minute after the little skirmish, Mo Salah pokes one into the net. Then 51 minutes played. Rob Holding happens. Now I know, I may be a little too harsh on Rob Holding considering he has improved this season. Not to mention he did step up against both Palace and Leeds. But this is Liverpool we're talking about here, and he seems to always f*** up in these big matches. Luckily for us though, the Senegalese lasers were still having their effect on Salah. But by no means did that calm the storm. In fact, 
Liverpool's attack turned into a Category 5 hurricane. And in the 86th minute, Liverpool finally found their equaliser through a man who continues to haunt every Arsenal fan imaginable. With the score now 2-all and the title race opened up, Arsenal were desperate to find the winner. Unfortunately though, Arteta had already subbed off our best attacking threat in the midfield for a defender. Now listen, Arteta's done really well with our substitutions. This is the one big outlier and it so happens to be in one of the biggest games of the season. So instead of us searching for the goal and going for the kill, we were holding on for dear life. But in the end, thanks to Aaron Ramsdale's heroics, we luckily maintain a draw after initially being 2-0 up. This was a pretty massive blow to the title race, but there was no need to panic just yet. Next, Arsenal played West Ham and had an incredible response to all the questions and doubts throughout the week by scoring two early goals. West Ham would get one back through a penalty in the 32nd minute, however, we earned a penalty of our own in the 51st minute and Bukayo Saka misses it horribly. And just minutes later, Jared Bowen scores the equalizer for West Ham and once again, Arsenal bottle an early two-goal lead. Even worse news, City won their fixture the previous day, meaning the gap was now just four points. Okay, whatever. Those games are in the past. We are still in the league, and our next match is against last place Southampton, at home. Perfect opportunity to grab all three points and get right back on track. Great atmosphere, floodlights on, lovely pitch. They've got to play... And an error from Ramsdale. Alcaraz scores! <laughs> Already the fact that this had happened once in this season was bad enough. Twice, and I'm starting to think the football gods are f***ing with me. Oh, they are f***ing with me, alright. But hey, if lightning can strike in a bottle twice, what's stopping it from happening a third time? Five minutes after the second Southampton goal, Saka squares it to Martinelli, who puts a line drive into the net, and the boys have their belief back. Oh, Prowse without swing! But do not give up hope yet, my friends. 87 minutes played, Martin Odegaard shrinks the deficit. There is still time. 89 minutes now, Nelson's shot is saved, but it falls right to the star boy himself. Three all at the Emirates. We refuse to bow down to the football god scripts. First minute of stoppage time now. It's Leandro Trossard from the top rope. And he hits the crossbar. Unfortunately, that was the end, as Arsenal couldn't find another breakthrough in the Southampton defense and the whistle blows. All that could be heard were roars that turned into an even louder eerie silence within a split second as players collapsed to the ground. This was the moment to create a temporary safe cushion, and they blew it for the third straight week. Now that we're up to date, here's the table now. It's a bit deceiving because while Arsenal have a five point lead, City have two games in hand. One of those games, however, is against Arsenal this coming Wednesday as of this recording. So if Arsenal can somehow get a result against City, they can still have a one to two point lead over the reigning champion. But I'll be completely honest with you guys, I don't think that's happening. Since the beginning of February, Arsenal have had the 7th worst defense in the league. On top of that, it feels like our errors are starting to catch up with us. The urgency is growing in the league, so these types of errors just cannot be allowed. Also, City have only drawn once in their last 12 fixtures. They have seemingly conquered their struggles and are now in peak form at the best time of the season. Oh, and by the way, Saliba still injured. I don't have any hope right now, but believe me, once that whistle blows on Wednesday, all that negativity flies out the window and it's a hundred percent belief. It's f***ing time, baby! It's f***ing time! No more of this bottling! No more! No more, none of this disrespect. Who cares if we don't have Saliba? I don't care anymore. It's City Arsenal. If we beat them, and we f***ing will, we're going to win the f***ing league. We're winning the league. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. <laughs> oh. I mean, it's only 1-0. The New York Giants had like seven losses and they won the Super Bowl in 2007, okay? Still plenty of time. Consider this the regular season. I just, I just want to have time to come, you know? I, I, don't, I don't mind if there's like one minute of stoppage time. Wait, how, how many minutes we got? Tell, tell me. Tell me. So we're into two minutes of stoppage time. Two minutes, oh thank God. Oh thank God. The torture doesn't have to last too long.
God bless. I know the football gods always got me. He makes a shape here that few others can. In oh no. <laughs> oh! Oh, it's outside! Oh, thank God! Oh, thank God! <laughs> oh, I always, I always know the football guys got me! Oh, the football association was spitting when they put the offside rule in. What the f*** is go- Oh, that does not look good. You can't do this to me. You can't do this to me. Tom, this is gonna be a goal. Sick, man. <laughs> ah! Put me out of my misery. Bury me six foot deep. Actually, no, 12 foot deep. That way I don't even have to feel the aura of this game. Update the score. Ah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. You, you, you're right, you're right, you're right. <laughs> you know, I, I had hope for the first six minutes. Man City just always seemed to be two steps ahead of us, and Kevin De Bruyne, I mean, he was free to do whatever the hell he wanted. And man, when the City players would just stand over the ball for like five seconds, do nothing, all the while City fans in the stadium were just politely clapping, it was just, it was just fucking demoralizing, man. But hey, you know, it's only 2-0. We've been 2-0 down before. And perhaps Arteta can cook up the greatest halftime team talk the world has ever seen and will prevail and, and win this match. <laughs> Sake, man. Why did I have hope? Arsenal did manage to get one back through Robert Holdini. However, then Erling Haaland revealed his final form to the world and finished us off. And so, Arsenal once again. Yeah, I know, you're ready to hear it blew it in april as well and i still haven't even done my your lie in april rewatch this is gonna be a tough end to the month looking at the table now i don't really want to look at the table right now arsenal are still top but city with their two games in hand can easily jump over us it sucks you know majority of the season we were top of the league and just couldn't hang on to it i think what makes this even more miserable is the fact that this has been almost inevitable not trying to be negative here but i could see the signs that we were starting to break our depth was starting to be an issue in the later stages of the season and those injuries that happened recently were only accelerating that downfall i mean when your third choice center back is rob holding I mean, that's just not sustainable. And you know, in this video, there were a bunch of errors from Arsenal that led to goals. But it's not like those errors just kind of happened out of the blue in the middle of the season. They've been happening since the very beginning. It was really only until mid-season that they started to punish us. Especially after the World Cup, when noticeably our form kind of dipped. And while Arsenal's comebacks were incredible to watch, I feel like there was a little bit of an imbalance on how they were portrayed. Because sure, every comeback showed amazing grits, exceptional character. We showed time and time again that no matter what, we would continue to fight until the whistle. And that has been something that has defined this new era of Arsenal in the last two seasons. But I don't think I saw that much criticism towards our defense that had gotten significantly worse since the beginning of the year. In the first half of the season before the World Cup, Arsenal had one of the best defenses in the league. They were actually second right behind Newcastle. However, since the beginning of this year, we've had the seventh worst defense. You just can't win the league with that. And finally, going back to our squad depth. Most of our players weren't injured, but they sure as hell were fatigued. I mean that both mentally and physically, because after three games blown, I don't care how strong you are, that will affect you. I know there's still a tiny chance that Arsenal could win the league, but let's be fair here, man. It's not happening. The title race is over. Man City showed they were by far the more superior team at this stage of the competition. And right now, we're not even at our best. We blew leads against Liverpool, West Ham. Couldn't even get a win against Southampton at home. And not to mention, we still got a couple difficult matches going forward against teams that are in threat of relegating and also Newcastle away. Listen, I want to be wrong about all the things I'm saying here, but I just can't see it happening. It's a hard pill to swallow, man, but honestly... I'm just happy I got to experience this incredible season. It was an absolute joy to watch this team play. 
aesthetics to a T. The attack of Gabriel Jesus, Gabriel Martinelli, Bukayo Saka, Martin Odegaard just produced magic that I had missed since I was a sophomore in high school. And how could I forget about Leandro Chosard? That man was an instant impact the immediate moment we signed him. It was even more wonderful to see Granite Xhaka thrive after everything that he's been through. And for a while, I actually had faith in our defense, which is something I haven't felt honestly ever. William Saliba, easily the best defender of the season. His partnership with Gabriel was immense. Sucks that he got injured and I hope he comes back. I heard there's a little bit of a setback, but again, I hope he comes back stronger, better than ever next season. Also, Ben White and Tomogotsu. I think sometimes they had their issues, but for the most part, they were pretty good. I'm just hoping that also Takahiro comes back better than ever. And while Zinchenko hasn't had a good performance in like the last four games, there is no doubting how impactful he has been for us throughout the entire season. And remember, he was only 35 million. Aaron Ramsdale also had his blunders throughout the season. I mean, you know, the, the Southampton one kind of comes to notes. But honestly, if it wasn't for him, I think this title race would have ended a month ago. Also, one honorable mention, Reese Nelson. This dude has gone through the lone carousel, and to see him execute in the clutch like he has is just very satisfying to see. Just in general, though, this journey has been a roller coaster of emotions throughout the whole season. I'll never forget the emotions I felt seeing us get revenge against our rivals, beat Liverpool at home, come back against Villa and Bournemouth, and of course, my favorite memory of all, that game against United. And I wanna stress this enough, no one saw Arsenal being this strong of a title contender all the way up to this point of the season. Like I said, it's a sucky feeling. Especially since throughout the season, even the thought of Arsenal lifting the trophy got me a little emotional. Because that's something I've wanted to see all my life. I didn't get to see the Invincibles. I didn't get to see the Champions League final where we lost. I didn't get to see any of that. But let's not forget that we have secured Champions League football. I know that's 100% copium, but listen, I haven't seen Arsenal play in the Champions League since 2017. No longer do I even have to think or even look at a Europa League logo anymore. That's bliss in itself. And it doesn't even feel like a one-time deal. Arsenal are going in the right direction, and more money is only going to propel us farther. All credit goes to Mikel Arteta for that. No longer is the message trust the process. Now it's simply, if you don't get the vision now, you're a dumbass. Because if you, in the year of our Lord 2023, are not convinced that Arteta is the man for this job, then Jesus Christ, I don't know how you'll ever be happy. To sum this up, we bottled hard. But despite all the frustration I have, I still can't help but look back and be grateful for what I got to witness as a fan. Especially after so many years of pain and dread, waking up in the morning only to see Arsenal disappoint me once again, it's just so refreshing to see. We didn't win a trophy this season, and I know this is 100% copium, but with this team still so young and the stability to complement it, the future is very bright. But what do you guys think? I sure can't wait to look at my social media DMs where all I'll see is just bottle emojis for the next eon. But of course, a massive shout out to all our patrons, including Janos Balas, Chris Damaseno, Meliwe 9 Aldipu, Alex Rod, Ulta, Amin Sumez, Araisan, Carlos Anaya, Daniel Ortiz, Francisco Hernandez, Guy, Joao Carvalho, Jonah, Marco Fujimoto, Miguel Munoz, Return Fire, Rory Burns, Saw, Slider Kit, Sniffrix, The Motor Drive, Tomicus, Vanilla Mexican 17, Victor, Chris Visconsi, Dominic Griffin, Emmett Shea, Louis, Joao Paricio, Michael Nista, MX Weeb, Nish, Patrick Barley, Thomas, and Unbroken Persona. If you'd like to join the Patreon, there'll be a link down below and up in the annotations. You can follow my Twitter if you want, follow my Instagram if you like, the DMs are open, just saying. Uh, you can follow my TikTok, I think there's DMs there, I don't know, um, but trying to get to 20,000 there. And of course, you can follow my semi-active Twitch, which I actually streamed on recently, and the stream didn't die after two hours and restarts. So, there is some hope, I really want to stream in the future, I know I've said that so many times, but it'll happen, I promise, at some point. But until then, I'll see you guys.